Without more delay, I'm going to introduce our first speaker, Jeff Talbert. He's a composer for games, films, and advertising. In 2007, he launched Jeff Talbert Film and Video Scoring to combine his passion for movies and games with his love of music. His career thus far has led him to collaborate on games like Fairy Solitaire, Chimpanzee Catastrophe, Fairy Alchemy, and Dragon Embers, and such films as Wyatt Steps Out, Bobby Ellis is going to kick Shandwick, Studio 216, Happy Candidates, and a lot more selections there that you can find his hall bio online. So he's going to talk about mixing. Jeff Talbert, everyone. All right, thank you all for coming. Let me just turn on my little stopwatch here. So there we go. Yeah, so I'm going to be talking about the goals of mixing, and just to be clear, uh, I'm talking about mixing music, not um, doing full game mixing. So um, this is specific to music, but obviously can be applied to other audio stuff as well. Um, last year, at some point, I started uh, remixing a lot of my old tracks for um, inclusion in libraries and things like that. So I went back and like revisited a lot of my old stuff and I thought a lot during that period about mixing and how to make my mixes sound more professional and more high quality and be more efficient while I was doing it. And in the process I came up with uh, four goals to kind of help myself step back and take a look at the big picture rather than get mired in the details, which I tend to do. So I'm gonna go through those for you today. thought I would share those. First, let's talk just for a second about what a goal is. What is a goal and how can it help us uh, stay focused? Uh, according to the Oxford American Dictionary, which is the first one that came up online, uh, a goal is the object of a person's ambition or effort, an aim or desired result, and the destination of a journey. So if we think of mixing as a journey, which it really is, uh, goals help us stay on the proper path and headed in the correct direction. They also help us step back and stay focused on the big picture and not get lost in the details like I was mentioning before. Think of a goal like a compass. Helps keep you oriented in the right direction and it helps you make those reorientations, those course corrections, faster and more easily. And because mixing is such a huge topic and I have 20 minutes to talk about it, um, I set up a page on my website, um, jefftalbert.com slash mix resources and I've put some uh, links up there to books and articles and websites and videos and various other things that can be helpful to you guys. Uh, I'm, I'm probably going to add more to it in the next few days or week or so um, and I'll leave that up for you know in perpetuity so if you ever want to go back there and find out more information about mixing more than I can cover right now uh, feel free to check that out. So let's get to the first goal. First goal is energy and emotion. Music, as we know, is all about emotion. Um, it can make us cheer, cry, feel angry, scared, pump us up, calm us down. It has a direct link, basically, to our emotional center of our brain. Um, and the question here really is how can mixing enhance that emotion or undermine it? Um, I'm thinking specifically about, like, uh, for example, like say you have a solo piano piece um, that you, that's a sad piece of music. There's a number of different ways you could mix it. You could put a lot of reverb on the piano. You could to make it sound far away and lonely. You could also make it totally dry and upfront and intimate sounding. And they could both have a sad effect, but it would be different. So you want to think about you know with a particular piece of music what um, what your choices will do in terms of uh, fine-tuning that emotional response in the listener. Um, there's a number of ways of coming up with uh, ideas on how to do this. Um, I can't like list them all right now, nor would I want to, because I would rather have you guys come up with your own solutions for this stuff. So one good thing is to listen to uh, some of your favorite pieces of music and identify what the emotion is that it's conveying, and then make a note of what the mix techniques are and how did they enhance that particular emotion with the mix in question. Um, and then if you want to go even deeper, you could make iTunes or Spotify playlists of various emotions, sad songs and happy songs and angry songs. And then whenever you need to mix a piece with that particular emotion, um, listen to some of those tracks and say, hey, wow, I really like what they did with the strings here. I could do that on my piece. 
And as far as energy, um, here's an example of how you can use the mix to enhance the energy of a particular piece. Um, I've got a rock track and the first mix is pretty pretty normal. It's all sort of like everything is mixed the way it sort of came out, the, the way it was originally recorded. And then in the second mix I've enhanced the energy uh, with some effects. And listen in particular to the drums on these. So here's the first one. So it sounds okay. The guitars are distorted. Um, I didn't really change the guitar as much, but I'm listening to the drums on the second one, and I also added a little bit of uh, distortion to the bass. So listen to the difference. So the drums sound a lot bigger. Um, basically what I did was um, I added, like I said, some overdrive to the bass, but I also compressed the drum mics, um, especially the, the room mics and the ambient mics. And then on the whole drum kit, I added parallel compression, which in a nutshell, I don't have time to go into all the nitty gritty, but again, I've got stuff on my, on my resources link. Uh, parallel compression basically involves taking an uncompressed track and mixing that with a heavily compressed track. And um, there are various ways to do that. Some compressors even have a mix control where it makes it really easy to do that. And what that gives you is um, the power and intensity of the compressed track, but without the, one of the things that compression does is it really kind of shaves off the peaks and makes stuff sound a little bit mushy. Um, so mixing in the original track lets you keep those punchy transients from the original track along with the, that extra power of the compressed track. So it kind of enhances the room tone, but also keeps the drums kind of in your face. So um, that's a technique that I really love a lot. And again, check it out on the, on the resources link and try it for yourself. Let's move on to goal number two, clarity and balance. Um, goal number one is a lot, has a lot to do with sort of the art of mixing. And this is a little bit more like the science and the craft. And in this case, what we're trying to do is create a clean, clear, mud-free mix in which all the parts, individual parts, are audible. You know, you presumably spend a lot of time writing all your different parts. You want people to be able to hear everything, all the little accompaniment details and stuff. And you also want to make sure that all the levels are appropriately set. So how do we do that? Uh, it's a combination of volume automation, compression, and EQ generally. And in particular, in terms of clarity, I use two main EQ techniques, um, high pass filtering and something called surgical EQ. High pass filtering is essentially removing the low frequency stuff. Um, what that does is it leaves a lot more room for the bass instruments. Um, on like a rock mix, it would be like kick drum and bass, obviously, uh, and other things, you know, depending on whatever, whatever's you know, holding down the bass line. And uh, it also removes muddiness uh, from your mix, which can be a real problem. Not, a lot of non-bass instruments have low frequency content. Things like acoustic guitars, pianos, synthesizers, organs, lots of percussion instruments like djembes, things like that. And those can get in the way of your bass line if you don't control those low frequencies and make the bass line really hard to hear. Um, I'm a little bit biased because I'm a bass player, but uh, in my opinion, bass line is second only, in only to the melody in importance. Um, it helps to anchor the melody and it also establishes a harmonic foundation for the piece. So it's kind of the, you know, the melody's on the top, the bass line's on the bottom, and everything else is sort of sandwiched in the middle. But you want those two outside parts to have the, the most prominence. So you use high pass filtering to sort of clean up and make room for that bass line. Um, the other thing that I mentioned is muddiness. We want to get rid of muddiness because that has the same effect. It clutters the bass line, but it also, um, can just make the mix sound really kind of woolly and mushy and not good. Um, I hear that a lot. I hear a lot of muddiness on, on amateur mixes generally. Um, it can include things like um, just general room noise, um, hum, like 50 hertz hum, things like fans or, you know, if there's air conditioning going and you don't realize it when you're recording. 
traffic outside, footsteps of the musicians, all that stuff gets recorded on the track. And you might not actually hear it on an individual track, but when you combine like 30 tracks together and all that stuff builds up, you get this, you know, really awful noise that can interfere with your, in, with your mix. And it can obscure the arrangement and cause all kinds of mix problems. So the solution to both of these is something called high pass filtering. And it looks like that. Most, most generally good um, uh, equalizers have some sort of high pass filter on them. And I do it on pretty much every track, even the bass instruments. Um, on bass instruments I go, I high pass filter from anywhere from 20 hertz up to 50. Um, that's all sort of considered like the sub bass region. And it's important to have that in there, but you don't want a ton of it because it can overpower the mix and it can, and again, obscure the bass line. Uh, I typically, like if it's a rock mix, like a kick drum bass situation, I'll high pass filter one of them a lot higher than the other, um, closer to 50, and leave the, the sub bass stuff on the other one just so it has some power, but then they kind of sit apart from each other. They, you can make them out better. They're clearer. It also helps to um, tighten up the, the bass and the kick drum a little bit too when you high pass filter like that. Everything else, I'll high pass filter from 50 to 80 hertz all the way up to 1000 hertz and above, wherever I need to do it. Um, basic high pass filtering involves uh, pulling up your EQ. Um, I usually turn on the analyzer so I can see the waveforms like here. And then I'll find like the meat of the sound where the sound starts. You know, in this case, it's on the bottom here. And I'll high pass filter just below that. So that gets rid of any extra hum or anything that might be on that track that you're not hearing. In a lot of cases, though, I'll go up higher than that because I, I want to remove some of that low frequency stuff. So on something like an acoustic guitar in a busy mix, you want to get rid of a lot of those low frequencies to, like I said, make room for the bass guitar or whatever the bass instruments are. And then we have something called surgical EQ. So this is sort of the rest of the EQ spectrum. And I like to think of the, e of the frequency spectrum like a bookshelf. So say you just built a lovely IKEA bookshelf all by yourself. You're very proud of yourself. And now you've got 30 books that you want to fit on a particular shelf, right? If they're all kind of thin little paperbacks, that's going to be fine. You're going to be able to fit them just fine. But if you've got like a bunch of dictionaries and encyclopedias and like the collected works of William Shakespeare, and you're trying to fit all of those on one shelf, it's not going to work because they're too, they're too fat. You might get 10. So frequencies are kind of the same. I mean, it's a little bit different because frequencies can overlap. Instruments can overlap, obviously, not like books. But I like to think of the frequency spectrum like that bookshelf. So you have a particular frequency, dominant frequency for each instrument, and you can enhance that on that particular instrument, and then if other instruments are, obs are obscuring that, you cut that from other instruments. So it looks something like this. So that little, that's obviously a cut, um, a wider cut, but then little narrow cuts like that, though that's surgical EQ at work. So you've got, this in particular is a piano, so on this mix, I had another instrument that was prominent at the, right around 2K. So I did a little cut there, and that makes a little bit more room for that instrument, the other instrument. And why do we cut rather than boost? Um, it's pretty simple, actually. Cutting makes more space in your mix. You're taking stuff away. And boosting actually adds sound to your mix. So you're making less space for everything else. Um, so I always cut first, uh, just as a general rule. It also avoids, there's also other down, uh, downsides to, to boosting, things like um, EQs always introduce a little bit of phase distortion, uh, a little bit of harshness, and when you cut, you're reducing the level of that rather than adding it. So it's always a good practice to cut first. Um, I do boost sometimes though, and when I do, I tend to use quality vintage EQs uh, or EQ emulation plugins for boost because just because they sound better. Um, I particularly like the this one is the Waves uh, Helios or Kramer HLS is what it's called, and that's a particularly nice one. But there's lots of uh, Universal Audio has some great ones, uh, SoftTube, Waves has some other great ones. So look for um, a nice vintage emulation when you want to boost. And as for one other thing as far as clarity, individual tracks may not sound great when you solo them, um, and that's okay. Like you can have an acoustic guitar that sounds really thin. Don't worry about that because you don't care how it sounds on its own. You want it to sound great in the mix. 
So try not to solo too much because that tends, you know, you tend to want to make things sound richer and fuller and that may not be important. And another little tip is something called molting. Um, a lot of times I will uh, say, in this case, I have a piano track and I want it to sound different in the bridge. So I'll use molting to, uh, instead of having to automate all these EQ moves and effects changes and stuff in that, in that bridge section, I'll just chop out that little section of the track, move it to a new track, and then I can do whatever I want on that track and not have to worry about any automation at all. It just makes it a lot easier. So try that out. Um, it's a really handy tip and I was extremely happy when I learned about it. And as far as balance, make sure that all your levels are appropriate, um, but you don't want them to be static and boring. So I tend to automate um, fader moves a lot of the time. Like I'll just record and, and just kind of move the fader just a little bit, just bring up, you know, when something interesting happens and bring it down on each, on each track or on many of the tracks. And this creates a more dynamic mix, um, keeps things moving, it makes it more, the mix more alive. And you can also highlight cool mov moments like fills and counter melodies and bring something else down, like when the guitar gets boring, you bring that down and bring up a little bass fill or something like that. And that just tends to make your mix more interesting. People can hear that, that movement in the mix. Goal number three is dimension, and that's both width and depth. Uh, we can't really do height, in, at least in stereo audio, so we're talking about two particular dimensions. Um, and sometimes you want a big epic sound, and sometimes you want a more, a more intimate sound, and those are obviously two different spaces that you're creating, but uh, so be aware of what, what your end goal is in terms of uh, the dimension of your mix, how big you want it to sound. They don't all have to be huge. If you're doing like a little jazz ensemble, you might want it to be on a small stage or even in a little, like a closet sounding space. Um, there's a lot to talk about here um, that I don't have time for, but one great tutorial is on uh, macprovideo.com. has something called Sonic Dimension and Mixing by a guy named Greg Townley. And he is a Hollywood mixer. He's done a lot of uh, film scores and trailer music and stuff. And this, I particularly recommend this uh, tutorial because it's really, uh, I learned a lot from this. And uh, one of the things that he talks about in particular is thinking about each element in the mix as either being in the foreground, the middle ground, or the background. And using things like reverb and uh, EQ to move things to the back and have something like way in the back and have something else right up front. And what that does is it creates contrast in your mix, so that gives you a much bigger sense of depth. If you have something way in the back, that makes that thing in the front sound a lot more intimate and close, and conversely, the thing in the front makes the thing in the back sound much deeper too, so it makes your mix bigger. It's kind of like looking at a landscape of mountains. If you have something in the foreground, that gives you a better sense of scale. And I like to listen to professional mixes, and I try to identify what the foreground elements, the middle ground elements, and background elements are. And that helps me improve my mixes. As far as creating width, uh, you can do panning, use stereo sources, and use stereo widening effects. Uh, as far as panning, you want to make sure that you keep the bass instruments and the most important elements in the center. Um, bass, it's nice to use both speakers, and they're all, the sounds are also less directional, so it helps to use both speakers for that. Uh, and obviously you want the important elements to be closer to the middle. Um, and beware of panning hard left or hard right, because it restricts the sound to just one speaker. And for example, if one of those speakers is malfunctioning or far away, parts may disappear. So I always leave a little bit in the other speaker. But that's just me. There, there are lots of schools of thought on that. Um, I tend to not overuse stereo tracks, because um, you can end up with something called big mono, which is basically a bunch of stereo tracks, and it all just kind of, it's stereo, but it's not that stereo. It's kind of less interesting. Um, often I find that panned mono sounds seem more stereo than actually using stereo sounds. So a lot of times with the sample libraries, I'll reduce something to mono, and then I'll pan it to a particular location. It seems to be more directional that way, and results in a more interesting mix. And be careful with stereo widening effects because many aren't mono compatible and I always uh, listen to my mixes in mono at the end of the mix. I put a uh, utility plug in and just turn on mono just to make sure that nothing disappears and 
I also use a phase correlation meter on the master bus again to make sure that I'm not losing any frequencies. And be careful not to overuse reverb. A little goes a long way. Set it where you can just hear it and then back it off. That's a good tip. And I like to also use delays instead of reverb um, because that can have the same effect but with less uh, muddying up of your mix. And that brings us to goal number four, which is making the mix sound great. Um, I like to use commercial reference tracks. I find a track that sounds similar to the thing that I'm mixing, and I bring that into my DAW, and then I compare it as I'm working, and that gives me a little reality check, and I can match the overall level, the frequency balance, the sense of space and drama, and um, make my mix sound a little bit more professional. And then I also, of course, want my mix to sound good alongside a professional track. If you created an iTunes playlist or somebody heard it on the radio or whatever, does it sound as good as a pro track? Um, and choose appropriate references. Mixes don't always need to sound polished and hi-fi. Um, so here's a quick example. Um, this is a little jazz piece, and the first one is the lo-fi version and then the hi-fi version. And the lo-fi is the one that I actually used. <laughs> And then here's the same mix without all the sort of crackly sounds and the, and the um, frequency changes that I made. So it still sounds good, but it doesn't, doesn't have that same sort of like vintage quality. And that's what I was going for in particular on that mix. So uh, those are the four goals, energy and emotion, clarity and balance, dimension, and making the mix sound great. Um, and as I said, uh, I've got a lot of resources available on that link, jefftolbert.com slash mixresources. And I think we have a few minutes for questions, right? Yeah, so if anybody has any questions about this stuff, I know I kind of blazed through this and I apologize, but 20 minutes is not very much time. <laughs> Um, the techniques that you described in your talk just now, does that yeah. apply to orchestral instruments as well, like or orchestra? Yeah, it does. Um, the, the interesting thing about orchestral mixes is that um, I think since those instruments have like evolved together for so long, um, I find orchestral mixes a lot easier to mix because everything sort of sounds nice together just by the way it's ev uh, everything has evolved. Um, you know, you do still want to do some high-pass filtering, I think, and, you know, some, some of the techniques, but it's a lot easier. This is more for, like, hybrid orchestral rock mixes, uh, rock mixes, ethnic stuff, any, basically everything else, where you're sort of throwing an amalgamation of instruments together that haven't grown up together the way orchestras have. Hi, if you're creating a, a, a music track for, let's say, an iPad game or an iPhone game, mm -hmm. w do you have different strategies for mixing for that? Uh, not really, but I definitely would want to listen to it on an iPad speaker or an iPhone speaker. You know, preview it before you, or even if possible, you know, mix it on that, or just at least keep sending it to your phone and, and listening. Because, yeah, you're going to, obviously, the frequency range is a lot more restricted. iPhones are mono, you know, if you're just using the speaker. So you, all, you definitely want to check for mono compatibility there. Um, so, yeah, the techniques are the same. You just, just want to preview it a lot more on the thing that you're, that you're using it on, or the, or the end um, platform. Yeah, we have time for one more. All right. <laughs> Uh, what you were describing with the drums, where you just uh, compress the drums and then you mix it with the other. Yeah. Does does that not cause a phase issue or anything? Or uh, it doesn't. Do not, at least not in my experience. Yeah. Because um, the tracks are technically they're still in phase. You know they haven't you haven't moved the drums either way, and then compression doesn't seem to cause those artifacts. You know you definitely want to listen. If you hear frequencies disappearing, then yeah, you are having phase issues. But generally with drums, phase issues occur earlier in the process. Like if mics are not positioned right when you're recording, if you're recording.